Can you give me an indication how many members are online? Yes, Mr. Jacobs, I'm, I'm still checking them. Welcome members. Um, I acknowledge members, um, the Valiers. How are you? Comrade Nas, I'm in. Thank you. Honorable members, good morning. Honorable members, good morning. Good morning, teacher. Good morning, good morning. Um, good morning, morning. Uh, Honorable members, 
we've just uh, received the apology of the chairperson. Recording in progress. Uh, she is in Cape Town and then on her arrival, I think she get some food and then got some uh, food poisoning and she is reacting. Hence, she uh, indicated that <coughs> she cannot be able to join the meeting. So according to the, the rules of the National Assembly, in the absence of the chairperson, we have to elect an acting chairperson to proceed with the meeting. So I would like to request members to indicate or raise their hands for the election of the acting chairperson for today's meeting. Thank you. Can I be noticed, King? Mm, I see. Honorable April. Uh, there's a hand of Honorable April and the hand of uh, Ms. Lubengo. So I'll start with uh, Honorable April. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I would like to nominate the name of uh, Honorable Faiz Jacobs to chair this meeting. The name of Honorable uh, Jacobs has been uh, uh, raised in a second. Ms. Lubengo. Thank you, uh, uh, Secretary. I second the name of the name, the name that was mentioned. Thank you. Uh, Honorable Lubengo has seconded the name of uh, Mr. Jacobs. Any further name? No indication for any further name, so. In that uh, order, we will request uh, Honorable Jacobs to be an acting chairperson for the session. Uh, thank you, Honorable Members. Then I will hand over to Mr. Jacobs to proceed with the meeting. Thank you, Mr. Jacobs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. King, and uh, greetings all the Honorable Members, uh, our guests, invited guests, uh, and also the viewers. Uh, um, on the social media and uh, uh, parliamentary channels uh, platform. Welcome everybody. This is the Portfolio Committee of Small Business Development uh, today. Um, I'm honored to stand in for our chairperson, uh, Ma Violet Sitzwela. Um, uh, we wish her well. Um, I also have been informed that she has food poisoning, so we wish her well and we accept her apology. The meeting is formally open and you all are welcomed. Uh, the purpose of today's meeting is to get briefings from the Banking Association of South Africa and also to get briefings from the National Treasury's Cooperative Bank Development Agency, uh, responding the, to the cooperatives and also funding for uh, SMMEs. Um, before I do an introduction, I want to start with uh, calling for formal, uh, sorry, roll call and apologies. Let's uh, Mr. Kunene, um, roll call and apologies. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, uh, good morning, uh, honorable members. Good morning, colleagues from the various institutions. Chairperson, I've received an apology of the Chairperson and the apology of Mr. Of honorable Zumula. And then on the platform that I've uh, identified, it's Honorable Jacobs. Honorable Matulela, Honorable Nkosul Tuli, Honorable Tivilas, Honorable Tromelan, Honorable Lubengo, Honorable April, and Honorable uh, Hendricks. So those are the members who are in the platform, the members of the committee who are in the platform. They will then uh, make it possible that we form a quorum. Then on the visitors, I've seen the, some uh, representation from the department members from PASA, uh, Banking, uh, Banking uh, Association, and then from the CPTA. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for, for all of us, um, and we all again are formally um, acknowledged. Uh, I'm now called for the adoption members, if we can adopt this agenda. We have two main items. Uh, it's the briefing of the Banking Association of South Africa 
and then the Cooperative Bank uh, Development Agency of National Treasury. The main aim today is to look at access to finance. We clearly came out of COVID. Um, access to finance, especially in the informal trader and informal economy, and OSMME remains a big challenge. And we'd like to hear, uh, yes, there was um, uh, the, the bounce back scheme, there was the COVID relief, and we also um, want to, to hear how far we are with uh, uh, banks helping and assisting, especially with development finance. So that is the main purpose. Uh, we want to welcome everybody um, again, and uh, let me now invite members to uh, adopt this agenda. Um, any any members? Chairperson, Chairperson. Chair, before maybe we can adopt the agenda, I will propose from the secretary, having realized that there's a time concession, that we remove the consideration of minutes for course members have to go to London and then uh, adopt or second the, the agenda without that item giving time for members to prepare for the sitting. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Honorable April. Thank you, Chairperson. I think mine was going to be an apology that I'm going to have to leave the meeting before it ends for the, we have a sitting today, but I think it's covered now properly by, uh, by King. So thank you, King. What they said moving? now, why well, I'm moving you... for the, with the, of the agenda, excluding uh, uh, the, um, the minutes. Thank you. Honorable De Villiers. Yes, um, good morning, Chair, and good morning, colleagues. Um, I would just like to tender my apology. I'm going to go into the MTBS lock, uh, lockup at approximately 11 o'clock, so I will stay online and in the meeting until we have to go into the medium term budget locker. Thank you very much, Chair. Okay, apologies uh, noted. Um, thank you. Uh, that is very important, urgent work that we are doing. So members, we have a very busy day. Today is the mini budget and uh, some of us will be in the city hall um, and we'll all have to rush to get to the city hall by, by 12.30. So uh, uh, colleagues, uh, honorable members, we're gonna try to be as business-like as possible. Those that are presenting, if you can be also as prompt, because we want to conclude deliberations. This is a critical uh, debate, but we want to conclude deliberations by by twelve thirty. With that, we um, we want to invite the Banking Association of South Africa to take the platform. Um, I I'm not sure who's leading. I think it's the CEO, um, uh, Mr. Kuneni. You can. Uh, uh, give them sharing rights, and uh, over to you. Uh, before Chairperson, there's a hand from uh, uh, Honorable Kruger. Oh, let me check. Honorable Kruger, sorry. Thank you, Chair. Um, no, I just want to apologize of uh, joining late. I just had a few um, problems with my, you know, with my gadgets, but I'm here now, and I'm fully ears to listen to everybody. Thank you, Jay. No, great. Thanks, we need your wisdom, Honorable Kruger. Um, let's move away now from the formalities and uh, invite uh, the team of BASA to uh, take platform. Um, my apologies, I'm not sure if uh, who's leading, so I can't call out. Uh, uh, is it uh, Mr. Kulukani Mate? Welcome, uh, sir. Uh, nice to see you again, and uh, um, you can lead your team. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Honorable Acting Chair. And uh, good morning to all uh, honorable members. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, come and present to the committee on uh, the topic that was uh, outlined by the <clears throat> Acting Chair. Firstly, just by way of introduction, um, I would like to table an apology on behalf of the CEO of the Banking Association South Africa, um, Ms. Kunene. She is unfortunately not able to be here with us today. She is traveling abroad. And so she has asked that I lead the team that will be uh, presenting 
Together with me, I have colleagues, uh, Mr. Paul Stober, if you don't mind just showing your face, uh, sir, and uh, waving. Um, I also have uh, my colleague, Mr. Muzi Kunen, uh, sorry, Muzi Mklambi. Um, if you could also just show your face, Muzi, so the members, honorable members can see you. And I also have my colleague, uh, Mr. Hangui Lipazi. Um, uh, please do likewise, uh, Hangu. So that, that is the team from the Banking Association that will be engaging uh, with you, honorable members. I will uh, lead the presentation, but I promise you that uh, the, the, the members of my team are the most knowledgeable ones on the subject, so they will assist with um, the, 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 the presentation or the taking of the questions uh, later on. So um, honorable members, uh, just by way of uh, starting this presentation, uh, let me just get it onto slideshow. Uh, okay, I think I've got it right. Yes, so just by way of uh, uh, an, an outline of the issues that we will cover very, very briefly, those are the issues that we will cover in the presentation. I'll give you an overview of the industry, how, how we work, and we will also talk a little bit about the contribution of the banking industry to the economy. We will talk about um, what happened during COVID and the loan guarantee scheme the relief that was provided, we will talk about transformation in the industry, and then talk about the uh, micro, small and medium enterprises, get a sense of a profile, and what are some of the key considerations that are taken into account when lending into this sector of the economy or lending generally, and some of the challenges and possible uh, solution to, to those challenges. So just by way of orientation, we have a total of 41 banks in South Africa, of which 14 are South African commercial banks. Uh, four are South African banks that are um, foreign controlled, and then 13 foreign banks that operate in South Africa, three mutual banks and seven cooperative banks. Um, this is according to um, the, the, the Saab. And, um, the majority of, 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 of members of, of banks that are operating are, are members of the banking association, um, except for cooperative banks, which are not yet members of BASA. So again, just by way of setting the scene for this conversation, we thought we would start by just saying, what is a bank and, and what does um, a bank do? So in simple terms, uh, honorable members, uh, a bank is a financial intermediary that whose job is to collect deposits from savers and provide loans to those who want to borrow. In this task, there are obviously some requirements for lenders and, and, and borrowers. On the lender's side, there's obviously the need and the requirement to minimize risk minimize cost and liquidity. In other words, to make sure that banks um, are able to meet the demands uh, by depositors when they want their money back. So they have to hold assets that are easy to convert into cash. And the need to minimize cost is of course, uh, of course, uh, 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 you know, lending can be costly, but banks have to try and minimize the cost and they do that by pulling the resources together to make the friction that would exist if individuals were to run around and looking for people who want to borrow and enter into individual agreements and as well as uh, businesses running around to 10 different uh, individuals to ask for loans that would just be too costly both in terms of time, et cetera. So banks play that role of bringing these different actors together and minimize the friction. But of course, borrowers want 
it now or at a specific date. Um, they want money for a specific period of time and they want it at the lowest cost possible. Now, banks have to try and match the time, the specific period of time that uh, borrowers want the money for, um, which might not always accord with the saver's um, appetite. In other words, the savers may be prepared to, 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 to have their money lent out for a shorter period of time while the borrowers want it for a longer period of time. So again, banks have to play the role of um, uh, 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 dealing with the, the time requirements of the different actors. And so um, to simplify what I've just said, in banking, we would say that the role of banks is what is referred to as size transformation. What this really means is that they collect small amounts of deposits and they pull them together to meet the requirements of large borrowers. They also play a function that is referred to as maturity transformation. And what this means is that um, as, as we've said, the borrower may require money, let's say for a 12 month period, when in fact the depositors are only depositing, depositing their money for a much, much shorter period. So banks would then take the deposits of different kinds from different people and perform what we call maturity transformation such that they are still able to give back the money to the depositor when they want it, but at the same time, give a borrower a loan for the period of time that they, they want. For instance, they will give a loan for a house, which is over 20 years. They will give a loan for a, a car, which is over three, five years, depending. But very rarely do borrowers, uh, lenders go to a bank and say, keep my money for five years or keep my money for 20 years. So this maturity transformation role that banks play allows um, those who want money at different times to be able to access such money. And then of course, there's the risk issue, which is risk transformation. Different people have different risk profiles. In, a, in other words, a, a chance that they are likely to default, right? But banks will uh, take deposits from people and lend to people with different risk profiles such that um, the risk is then minimized through a number of uh, instruments that they use, diversifying their investments, and obviously better screening and monitoring the behavior of borrowers. But banks are also required to hold capital uh, and, and reserves as buffers for those unexpected losses. The other important role that banks play is to help with the flow of money um, in the economy, as well as facilitating uh, payments. What do we mean by flow of money? So let's make an example here and say that money would flow, flow from the household sector, or put simply from an individual who wants to save. They will put it in a financial institution. Um, the financial institution will in turn either lend it on to businesses um, or as it happens also lend to, 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 to government, right? And what will happen there is that the businesses will use the money to perform, um, to run their businesses. They will generate profits um, against which they will then pay uh, taxes to the government financial institutions themselves will pay taxes to the government and households themselves will pay taxes to the government. Households may also buy shares uh, of securities from the business sector. In other words, there would be a flow of money directly from households to businesses where households are buying shares. And there will be a different flow of money back to the households in dividends to those who have bought um, uh, shares. There's also a flow back to the households in the form of loans. So money moves around in different ways and banks stand in the middle and help that flow of funds. 
They also facilitate just general payments and transactions that happen in the economy. Um, and they, these run into millions of transactions um, a, a day and a week and a month. Every time you pay uh, for anything, um, a bank is involved there, at least most of the time. Now we have other actors who, who are uh, playing in the payment space, but the large majority of transactions will be performed and there will be a bank role in all of that. And just to, to then continue. So the primary business of banks is to lend money to borrowers. Obviously those borrowers um, would have to meet certain criteria. So banks want to lend money to as many people, as many households and as many businesses as possible subject to uh, obviously application of, um, or the applicants meeting certain affordability criteria. What is often said in, in, in popular discourse that banks don't want to lend, they would have to be ridiculous types of businesses that um, do not want people to consume the product for which they exist. Imagine somebody who sets up a stall and sells amaguinya but chases away people who want to buy that product. It just does not make sense. And so banks want to lend, but when banks do not lend to a person, it is often because of uh, the affordability criteria not being met. So banks are some of the largest lenders to households, businesses, and the public sector. They have to do so in compliance with uh, many, many regulatory requirements, including those uh, provisions of the National Credit Act that prohibits uh, reckless lending or reckless credit. Just as an example, we did an exercise which indicated that there are some 244 pieces of legislation that uh, banks uh, have to take into consideration either directly um, or uh, as I've said, take into consideration when doing their business of lending. So this is a business that is highly, highly regulated. So where do they get their money? We have already spoken about this, but again, just to make uh, it clear that uh, banks, their main source of funding are the deposits by the household and business sectors they constitute some 73% of the funding of banks. So banks are funded 73% by uh, deposits. And then of course, uh, the shareholders are required to put uh, some of their own capital and that um, often constitutes 8% uh, and their other uh, smaller sources of funding. Um, in the books of a bank, um, the deposits that they collect are reflected or categorized as liabilities. They're liabilities because it is not their money. It is the money of the borrowers, which they can uh, withdraw at any given point and we say on demand. So this is a liability, you're holding somebody's money. Uh, you don't quite know when they're going to come and withdraw their money. So you had better have the money ready when they want to. But on the other hand, you have people who would like that, uh, to, to, to borrow that money and use it to finance businesses. And so banks play that role of um, keeping the, making sure that the money is safe when it is kept with them. And when they lend it out, it should be such that those who borrow can repay it so as to meet their responsibilities. So we call this, a fiduciary duty that banks have to protect the depositors' money. And as we've already said, um, the, 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 the money they use uh, is then, uh, I mean, they have, uh, is then uh, given out um, as loans. And the composition or the kinds of activities that banks give loan to are reflected in that pie chart, 36% mortgages and 31% overdrafts, loans and advances, etc. So it indicates that um, 
some two thirds of loans that banks make finance things like um, homes and business premises, business operations, and uh, general consumption, which is buying <coughs> of goods and, and, and services by the, the borrowers. Now, when borrow borrowers do not repay their money, it means that the assets of a bank decline. So in other words, when a loan is categorized as an asset in the books of a bank, it is an asset because it is money that is going to be returned to the bank. So when you take out a loan, you sign an agreement that you will return the money to the bank. So it is an asset in the hands of the bank. So when you don't pay, uh, it means that the asset that the banks are holding decline and the declining of the asset has a, an effect of uh, impairing the profitability of the bank and puts its sustainability into question. So banks have to make profit um, because they are businesses and the profits that they make from the loans go to the depositors. So there will be a percentage um, interest that is paid to a depositor um, to compensate them for having uh, given their money to, to the bank to be, to be kept by the banks or used by the banks. But they also pay uh, some or part of the profits to the shareholders. And who are the shareholders? In many instances, the large shareholders are pension funds. And so these are pensioners out there who depend on the money that ha they have worked for many, many years saved and this money is then invested by their pension funds. And when the pension funds get the profits from the investments, in this case, the banks, they are able to continue paying pensioners so that pensioners can live um, a decent life after, after, after or on retirement. So, so that's where, where the money goes, but they've, they've got to keep some of it. So they have to retain some of the profits so that they can grow the capital base, in other words, increase the capital that the banks have because the more capital they have, the more they can lend out to many, many more borrowers. And banks contribute both to taxes, GDP and employment. The financial services industry, not just banks here, we're talking about um, various uh, industries within the financial sector. This would include, include uh, the life offices and, and, and all kinds of insurers, et cetera. All of those pay some 30% of all corporate taxes. In 2021, this was 63 billion rand, despite this sector making up only 23% of GDP. So clearly they are punching above their weight in terms of contributing uh, to to, to taxes, um, but they also com contribute to, to employment. So here we're giving numbers of the six largest banks in South Africa. They employ over 154,000 people. So this is the contribution of the banking industry to uh, employment. What factors do banks do uh, take into account when lending or that determine bank lending? So in the first instance, um, Lending depends on demand by entrepreneurs. So somebody must want the loan, right? Um, so we call that demand. But of course, it is demand that has to be matched by a uh, credit worthiness. Um, it has to be people who, when assessed for credit worthiness, they can pass that test so on the one hand, demand, how does the demand happen? Entrepreneurs will feel confident and go and borrow when they think that the market conditions are such that they can run a profitable enterprise. But when the market conditions are poor and they don't see any prospect of making profits, they are unlikely to go and pile on debt because that could sink them. So the demand is dependent on the entrepreneur's assessment of the market conditions, uh, prospects of profitability. Um, and then of course, as we've said, the health of the economy 
is an absolute critical uh, determinant because it affects the market conditions of businesses. And again, I think it's important to say this because often we hear, and we see this in the banking sector, many people who present and wanting a loan, but when assessed, they fail the credit worthiness because they fail to demonstrate that they are operating in a market in which they can grow and become uh, profitable. So it's one thing to simply present yourself and, and apply for a loan. It is quite another to meet those uh, credit worthiness um, uh, tests, as it were. So during COVID, um, government initially uh, intended to, to announce a 200 billion rand uh, scheme, loan guarantee scheme. Again, this is not cash. This is simply a guarantee that says in the event that there is um, a, a default, we will be able to, 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 to meet those obligations to this extent. So first it was a 200 billion was muted. Eventually 100 billion was uh, announced and made available. Banks in their assessment of what credit appetite there was contracted. In other words, they said to the, the, the National Treasury and the SAAB, they, say, they said, we think we can lend out collectively an amount of some 67 billion rand. And of course, the, the, the agreements were individual. So each bank uh, would come forward and say, we think that this is how much we can um, uh, lend out as part of this scheme. But all of that put together uh, worked out to some 67 billion rand. What actually happened in practice is that if all 100% of applications that were received were approved, we would have been able to lend only 62.3 billion rand, right? In reality, uh, only 18 billion rands worth of, of applications were approved for reasons that we've stated above in terms of uh, credit, uh, uh, credit worthiness and passing um, the credit test. That is the amount that was um, uh, approved. And this graph, you should not strain your eyes trying to read everything that's there because it's not important. It just shows you from the time when the scheme started how it grew. Um, and as you can see, so the green bars represents what we call phase one of the scheme. So these would be the loans that were approved under the phase one con conditions of the scheme. And of course, the, 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 there was a review in phase two where the conditions differed slightly or changed slightly. That is represented by what I would call a yellow bars, but as you know, my um, understanding of colors is not to be relied on. And then of course, um, the, the red dots give you where we ended with all phases combined. And it shows you that the scheme plateaued quite quickly after growing for some time. And in the end, with every effort that was made, there was just not too many additional loans that people were applying for or businesses were applying for, which is why we ended where we ended with 18.43 uh, billion rand. So what also happened at that time, in fact, even before the scheme was launched, is that banks started providing relief to their customers before the introduction of the loan guarantee scheme, right? By February, 2021, banks had restructured loans, provided financial relief to businesses and retail customers to the value of 293 billion. Of this, um, 165 billion rand uh, was to corporate customers, 14% uh, to small and medium enterprises. So the total value of all of the relief and the restructuring of loans that was undertaken by banks to try and help their customers not to fall on hard times amounted to 617 billion rand. So this indicates to you that banks did not fold their hands. They actually tried to find different ways of making sure that some of their customers who had loans, loan agreements or credit agreements that needed to be serviced, but could not service those due to COVID, 
uh, were protected from what would normally occur when you fail to meet your uh, uh, service, your credit agreements. And that restructuring of loans was to the value of 617 billion rand. What we also did was we did a, a, an exercise of looking at the lending that took place at the beginning of uh, January or beginning of 2020, which was January, and look at December 2020. What we found was that um, before the onset of COVID, the value of loans that were on the books of the banks was 164.5 billion. And, and the volumes are as, as reflected there, 1.1 million in terms of volumes. These declined drastically uh, during the year as COVID set in and the regulations that were introduced, these declined drastically almost grinding to a halt. But by the end of the year, when uh, the conditions changed a bit, we moved from level five to lower levels. I think by end of the year, we were starting at level three or thereabout. Banks started to, to lend again to businesses and they were actually uh, slightly better than where they were in January. Again, this just demonstrates that um, banks did not fold their hands and banks are the types of businesses that want to get their product out there to be consumed and their product is a loan credit. So again, this just dispels the myth that banks do not lend, banks do not want to lend. As it happens, by the way, uh, banks are the largest lenders to SMEs, um, upwards of 60% of loans to SMEs are made by banks and not any other uh, 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 financial provider. Let's talk a little bit about uh, transformation in the banking industry. Again, we produce every year a report that tracks transformation in the banking industry. These are just some of the highlights in one slide, but there's a full report on this, which shows that in 2020, uh, banks spent some 33 billion rand on procuring from black controlled businesses. And this was up from 30 billion in 2019. They spent 56 billion on small businesses um, in terms of spending uh, on small businesses out of a total spend of 154 billion. It provided 19 billion in, in, in finance to black SMEs. They provided 10 billion to black farmers, 47 billion uh, towards affordable housing. What has also happened over time is that banks are transforming their workforces in 2020, some 87% of junior managers and 65% of middle managers in the banks were black. Um, and the ch challenge is still in the senior management category where at the time we stood at 45%. But if you plot a graph of this, the, gra the trend is one that shows continuous growth. In other words, banks continuing to grow their share of black people in all categories uh, of management. Something that is often spoken about, and this is on the graph uh, on the uh, right-hand panel, uh, deals with what is called ownership of banks, black ownership to be specific. We compare two years here, but we have a report that compares four years of what has happened in this category. Uh, in summary, the targets for voting rights uh, by black people in, 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 in the financial sector is 25%. And in 2019 and 2020, the, the, the performance of the industry was at 28%, which means that they exceeded the, the target. Um, the economic interest, and I will explain what that is, uh, stood at 23%. In fact, in 2019, it was 23.8, declined slightly to 23.6% um, in 2020. And this is really because um, some of the BE deals that uh, were concluded in the sort of mid uh, 2000s, so 2005 and thereabout, started maturing around 2015, 2016. And um, the, those shareholders uh, gradually started selling off um, a portion of their stake. We feared at the time that they might sell all of it and be back to where we were before these deals were concluded. And we are surprised, um, positively surprised, obviously, that uh, the sell-off has been very, very gradual. And what that means is that uh, 
those investors see value in holding bank assets or bank shares, and so they're holding on to them, which is uh, something to be to be to be commended. And just to indicate also that uh, there are targets set for uh, women voting rights and uh, women economic interest um, in 2020 and 20, uh, 2019 and 2020 stood at 12.6 percent, uh, and the target is 10 percent. Um, economic interest was 11.4, 10.7, when the target was uh, 10%. So there again, above target, even if uh, the target is relatively um, uh, low. We have been speaking about small businesses. There was a study that was done by the IFC, uh, International Finance Corporation, which is a member of the World Bank Group, um, which is called the Unseen Sector. It tried to estimate the size of the micro, small, and medium enterprise sector. And it estimated it at 5.78 million. This includes both formal and informal. But they further disaggregated this number. Um, and they found that some 2.9 million were survivalist entrepreneurs. Two million uh, others were informal in other words, informal businesses, and then only just over 800,000 enterprises were um, formal businesses. And this had not grown over a 10 year period. So this study was done comparing what had been um, the findings of an earlier study that was done in 2008. So over a 10 year period, the number of formal businesses had not grown. And that has to be a big question that we asked. Why is it that businesses are not able to grow, graduate from being informal to being formal businesses um, as indicated by this study? Some of the considerations, certainly from the, the banking side, that either affect lending into the economy and the health um, and success of, of, of small businesses we have already spoken about the health of the economy being a key driver. And we know that economic growth in South Africa uh, was very anemic, uh, uh, almost uh, uh, approaching a recession even before COVID-19. So we did not have a vibrant economy leading to COVID-19 that was disrupted by COVID. COVID disrupted an economy that was barely growing. And then you had the lockdowns, which essentially uh, put activity to a halt, and you, which then had uh, a, a, a major impact on, on, on businesses. And the other factor is obviously access to markets. It's one thing to have a business idea uh, and produce something and be good at producing that, producing a really good quality product. But it actually is only a business if that has a market and there is a market out there that you can sell to. In other words, people who want the product and people who are prepared to pay for the product because only then can you run a sustainable enterprise that is profitable. And of course, that will uh, determine whether you can access further resources to grow your business. The absence of which does mean that your ability to access a loan is um, uh, limited. And of course, one thing that is very well known by all honorable members, because it gets reported in this house time and time again, is the impact of late payments for services and goods. This is uh, both in the private as well as the public sector. But of course, the problem is more pronounced in the public sector. In other words, government paying for services that they consume from small businesses on time. The failure to pay has driven thousands of businesses to, to collapse. To, and the, we're talking here about businesses that would otherwise be profitable, but they are driven to the ground by the late or failure to pay them. So just from a lending point of view, um, one of the issues obviously that, 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 that has impact, that impacted the economy, the uncertainties that, that have happened, especially in this year, uh, the, the turmoil due to, to the war, but also um, you know, inflation has a major impact because 
it impacts on prices, the cost of shipping of goods and, and so on um, is, is, is impacted by, by inflation. So the need to stabilize the increase in prices is absolutely critical for the success of small businesses. You know, if you're going to place an order for some uh, goods at one point, and by the time you actually receive the goods, the prices have increased uh, drastically, you, 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 you run into trouble of uh, being able to sell those products profitably. Of course, the other thing is uh, financial information. So when a small businesses present to a bank or submit an application to a bank, they often are not able to provide sufficient financial information that enables the bank to assess their real um, uh, 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 situation. In other words, to assess the business itself, whether it is a profitable business, to be able to see what happens in terms of transactions, uh, to be able to see the turnover of the business, to be able to see whether they are profitable. Uh, so the failure to submit complete financial information is a big problem. What ends up happening is that you then have borrowers who know more about their businesses because of course it's their bread and butter. They, 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 they have a better sense of where the business is and what are the chances and prospects of the business. But because this is not presented to the lender, the lender is not able to essentially uh, come to a similar conclusion about the prospects of the business. And so this thing about uh, really helping small businesses with getting together information that enables lenders to make informed decisions, informed lending decisions is absolutely critical. And of course, uh, uh, smaller businesses would uh, have difficulties with just generally planning because they may lack some of those uh, financial skills to be able to plan and project where the business will be at what point in time, all of which is necessary for assessing the health of a business. Other issue is obviously uh, limited access to collateral. So small, small businesses just don't have any collateral. Um, they end up having to borrow and taking uh, personal loans to, to try and get some sort of uh, loan because they aren't able to put down any collateral. And of course, banks are trying the best they can to assist where they can. In this country, we do not uh, use uh, uh, what movable assets as, uh, as, as collateral. And, um, the ability or the lack of this or limited use of movable assets as, as collateral is obviously a challenge because it constrains banks' ability to capture uh, opportunities um, at the lower end of, 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 of the market. Because in many instances, small businesses will have some kind of uh, asset. It, it could be a van that they have which is a movable asset, but because these aren't really used as collateral, they're not able to uh, lend against those types of assets. So some of the solutions, and these are not solutions to all the problems, uh, but to some of the problems, is that banks do offer a diverse, a diverse uh, 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 products or, or pro, uh, initiatives to try and close the gap some non-financial support that is provided to, to borrowers. And this includes accounting packages to help SMEs uh, really keep proper records and manage their, their books. Also assist with uh, point of sale solutions. So the machines that are used to swipe. Now, those machines are important because they are able to keep a permanent record of transactions which would then enable a, a, a borrower or a small business to demonstrate that these are the kinds of transactions that I process per month. And, and that becomes part of the information that can be used to, to so actually supporting small businesses with uh, these point of sale devices serves more than one uh, purpose. The one is just to make sure that they don't hold on to cash, which is risky because they get robbed uh, frequently, but it also uh, serves a purpose of keeping a permanent record of transactions. Banks are also uh, innovating digitally to improve their ability to reach uh, SMEs and obviously decrease the cost uh, for SMEs in various, in various ways. 
Um, and, and banks are helping SMEs in, 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 in providing things like invoicing uh, software, um, enterprise and supplier development, et cetera, et cetera. So there are initiatives out there that are undertaken by banks, but I think the point to make is that it just cannot be banks alone. We need for this segment of the economy to have multiple sources of funding and support, and this is beyond banking, because uh, bank lending or funding is not always appropriate, especially for businesses that are sort of the ideation stage or even startup stage, where they're not even making or generating any revenue, you do not need to, to take a bank loan when you're, when you're not generating any revenue because bank loans by definition have to be paid uh, or serviced immediately. So uh, bank lending is more suited for businesses that are growing, that are already generating a, a revenues. So it does mean that other players in this space and need to come on board, and they are, but we need to grow the support that is given to small businesses so that there is um, different kinds of sources of funding that are available to small businesses. Development finance institutions can uh, play a huge uh, and, and important developmental role and serve as a bridge to commercial funding. In other words, assist those who would not immediately meet the requirements of a bank, help them to uh, get the basics right and get some funding that enables them to get off the ground and then later on access uh, commercial funding. And of course, partnerships are important between DFIs and commercial banks, and they must be encouraged. And on that note, uh, honorable chair and honorable members, thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable uh, uh, Mr. Kulikani Mate. Thanks for your presentation. Very, very substantive, very comprehensive. Um, members, here we have it. Um, we wanted the Banking Association to come and present to us, and they have certainly done a very thorough job of presenting a lot of the issues. This is a very important issue for not only uh, this portfolio, but as a as a whole, as the country. So. Um, Members, I'm going to invite you to uh, engage with the presentation. Um, we have, uh, and I put in some questions in the chat, uh, Kulakani, uh, for, for you to engage on. Um, time is against many of the members and many of the members are traveling. So um, what I've done, uh, we've done our own analysis on, on a range of things. And we've asked some critical questions and I put all of them in the, in the chat group, but uh, let me invite members. Um, let me not preempt, but let me check. Uh, members, it's your turn now. The banks have spoken. What do you say to them? Uh, are you happy uh, with this presentation? Access to finance remain the critical challenge in, in our sector. Um, we know that uh, the, the department Disburses only two billion rand uh, in the in the economy for small business for informal traders and that, and the need is much bigger. I think uh, last time minister spoke about almost a hundred or three hundred billion rand that's needed uh, for our economy to thrive. So members, I'm going to invite uh, uh, Mr. Kuneni. You can just help me indicate what members are ready to to ask questions. But while we wait for members, okay. So there's. Uh, Honorable Lubengwe, you, you may go first. Thank you. Honorable Lubengo, I recognize you. Chairperson. Let me welcome the, the presentation. My question is, what are the challenges that the banks are facing and what progress have the banks made so far in the bounce back schemes? I thank you, Chairperson. Thank you. Honorable Matulelwa. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, 
my concern uh, about the bank as well is that oh, when the small uh, uh, SMMEs, when they were in need of support and the banks were, were helping them, but now we hear that they were, they were giving them in a form of a, a, some loan. Um, I'm just, I just want to know how are, are, are they giving back to the community without, a, a, without a generating a profit? So, so we, we just want to know that because some, some banks, they usually generate some money in with any kind of um, forms of, of, of loans and whatever. So how, why are they not helping the small businesses without generating e -A -N -A 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 profits? Thank you, Chairperson. Yeah, I think I've, I've, I've also listed there that um, the banks have made more than, uh, I think it's uh, in 2021, the banks made the profit of 95 billion rand. Um, so everybody during COVID uh, struggled, but the banks made a whopping uh, profit. Um, the six banks, six big banks preserved uh, 6.9 billion capital to protect their business and deposit this fund. Uh, and a whopping 21 billion rand was paid to shareholders, pension funds, foreign investors, empowerment schemes, um, the retirement and investment funds that provide these pension schemes. Um, so the banks are making a profit. Um, and I think for me, the questions would be uh, the bounce back scheme um, that covers government. Government was saying, yes, 25% of the risk that will be covered why uh, could Abbas explain in detail, uh, was the risk sharing practical, given that the commercial banks and the public sector have different goals? How do the banks ensure that the risk shared mechanisms are transparent and also are protected from, from corruption? Um, I also want to know uh, what percentage of the deposits come from township uh, customers and what percentage lending goes to the township SMMEs? And how can how best can banks form partnership with lending institutions to address the finance gap? I think the finance gap currently is about 84 billion rand to serve the informal and the micro lending sector. What percentage of the current lending goes to the informal and micro sector? And what sort of legislation should we introduce to, to speed up lending to the SMME? We know it's almost, it's, it's, it's lawful, but it's, it's cheaper to get uh, a loan for a car, which is um, uh, consumptive, than to get a loan for a business which is uh, which produces uh, more things. So those are some of the questions I want to, uh, to ask. But uh, let's uh, get other members also in the in the space. I see there's a lot of members coming through now. Uh, Honourable Bridget, Honourable, let me let me start in this order. Honourable Tomelang, you number one. Honourable April, number two, and Honourable Goma, number three. Thank you, Chair. Good morning. I hope I'm audible. Yes, you are. Proceed. Thank you, Chairperson. Let me also welcome the presentation. But however, my interest lies more on the previous, previously disadvantaged group, which is women, youth, and people with disability. I want to check with the bank as to what is it that they are doing differently when they are assessing the application for funding to make sure that they are as the previously disadvantaged group and to make sure that they are inclusive, more especially to people who have not uh, been uh, benefiting uh, previously. What difference, uh, what systems they are doing? Because well, obviously the banks is a, it's, it's, it's a profit-making institution and also whatever they are doing, they are doing in, in intention of also benefiting from the people. But I want to check, is there any method or system 
that they have put in place to say, but these people have not benefited. They are previously disadvantaged. They come from rural areas. What is it that we are doing to make sure that we take them from the lower level and then put them at the higher level so that they can sustain the, the business chairperson? So another question is, how are they monitoring the very banks? How are they mentoring and supporting the uh, SMMEs that they have been uh, approved? Remember, some have been rejected before, but when they are approved, which means they need to be monitored and to be taken into processes. So I want to check if the bank has the system of monitoring their previously uh, rejected SMMEs when they are approved so that they cannot uh, misuse the funds that they have received. I think we share. Thank you very much. Um, can we ask the secretary to take the presentation off so that we can see uh, our members? Uh, uh, Honorable April, it's your turn. Thank you, Honorable, uh, Honorable Chairperson. I want to take this opportunity to welcome the presentation that was made by the bank. It was really informative. It was a bit long, uh, but here and there, one, one could take in some of the information and write it down. Chairperson, my contribution would be, I am extremely concerned that when the government gives a guarantee backing up scheme that the commercialized bank would still do a vetting mm -hmm. process according to what they, it would be in a, in, in a different circumstance. I would say that, uh, Chairperson, I am particularly worried that a black child is still not being empowered, even if we as a government come and say, here's our money that we guarantee that uh, should your things fall through or fail through, there's money to back up your, your risk. Now, I understand that the bank is a business that works according to risk and looks at every client according to their specific risk analysis, forgetting that we are in from, from, from a place where the black African child, as it were, would be at the back foot of the economy and not have the kind of collateral that the bank would consider as a risk minimizer when they lend out money. Therefore, the interest that 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 that, that banks are charging uh, Africans in particular is much higher than what white and privileged people are being charged. I will make an example. I go and apply for a vehicle, for a motor vehicle, and then um, my white kind counterpart, Jan de Villiers, go and apply for a vehicle. We both get approved for the vehicle. However, Jan is going to pay a much lesser interest rate for the same vehicle, and Hein is going to pay a much higher. Why? You ask, the, you ask the bank, why is Jan paying less than Hein? And then they will say, look, Jan is paying less because the risk category where Jan is falling in is much lower than Hein. And that is some unfairness that we need to look at. Uh, in the banking sector. And although it's so much regularized and so so over so over, so over lord to to for the lack of a better word, it is one of the things that is really a painful thing. The bank could be one of the biggest transformational wheels in terms of bringing the economic space back to the to in South Africa, where the space and the gap between the rich and the poor can only be made smaller by the banks. And one would really want to see a more active role being played by the banks, specifically when it comes to things like that. Chairperson, I would also want to bring it to the bank. This is nothing new, and it's not uh, news to the years that during the time of COVID, when the banks made the super profits, most of the people that lost a lot of assets and lost their houses and their cars are Africans in general. Um, it's 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 our people that has lost. Us. And and I would want to ask the bank in terms of 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 of, of racial classification, is there a law in the bank about that, or is it just a systematic strategic exclusion of the Africans to participate in the economic, um, in the economy of the land, especially when it comes to small business people wanting to access finance? The bank is being used as a as a as a tool to disperse these finances, but not necessarily by the rule book that they have written, which have for for the longest time excluded included Africans in particular. I know I may have sounded a little bit racial this morning, but the truth of the matter is how the banks deal with us is a racial, uh, is, is a bit racial, and I really want to bring it under the attention to look at it. I thank you, Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable April. Honorable Gomba. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable uh, the Acting Chair. Uh, 
I would just want to ask the association, I think they're aware of the, the law of demand in the economics. It says the, the more the things are cheaper, the more the demand grows. So I think there should be understanding that the more the interest goes down, the lesser the interest goes down, the more the demand grows, especially from small businesses. My question here is that, what is it that they do to ensure that they prepare themselves when the demand grows for the um, need for the loans that are people um, trying to find in order to grow their businesses? Are they really taking advantage of the time when there is a demand that is high and to ensure that they increase also the numbers of people that get those loans? Um, uh, uh, uh. Honorable Chair, I think also we need to also understand that not every African or South African will have a house that worth money or to be um, actually handed over as a co collateral in order to get some assistance from the banks. I want to find out what is it that is possible that they can do for such people, even if they don't have a, a, a collaterals, but they do have the way and they can see with their financial statements that these people can really achieve their goals. The other one, uh, Honorable Chair, the other last question is about the, 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 the population. You, you know, African people are more in the population and the more the population is growing, and the more you find that there is a high level of demand. And we find them being the ones who are really margin, marginalized in, in terms of getting those loans. So I, I don't know where, where are you, what are you saying about this factor? Because the more population, the more the population, the more the demand. So, and the more population is our African people. So I want to find out how, how many percent of African people do they assist in, in this instance of, of loans and other things? Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. Thank you very much, uh, our uh, um, member from uh, another committee. Thanks, uh, Honorable Gumba. Uh, I saw Honorable Lubengo wanted another bite. Oh, Honorable Lubengo, did you want to no, come in? No, Chair. I'm covered, Chair. Oh, oh sorry, my apologies, uh, my apologies. Uh, any other members? I'm just trying to go through the, the, the list of questions. Um, let me also raise, look, I think this, uh, uh, the one thing that was raised was the over 50% of South African SMMBs don't keep financial records. Um, traditional risk criteria such as tax status, financial statements uh, are typically required. In addition, during the COVID, uh, the link with tax debt increased partly during the lockdown. This put, was put as a barrier for SMME ability to access credit, um, but also increase the risk for both borrower and institution. Uh, is the banks coming up with any innovative ways to deal with the challenges that you have list? Um, um, I think the one point also that, uh, that was, was, was clear that um, the bounce back and the the loan guarantee scheme performance of the banks were very was very dismal. Um, what are the lessons that we could learn from from that? I mean, government made two hundred billion rand. Our president, which is a caring and responsive government, said to banks, "Hey, hey guys, uh, here is two hundred billion rand. We're going through a very difficult period. Uh, we will underwrite the risk for." Uh, for, for poor communities, for vulnerable working families that wants to start. Can you come up with innovative uh, products as the Banking Association 
uh, of, of South Africa. And what we saw was more of the same. Um, we didn't use the whole 200 billion rand um, uh, for creating opportunities in the market. It was basically doing this more of the same. Um, so for me, the question is around this dismal performance. What are the banks going to do different in the current bounce back scheme? Um, what are the targets that banks have set for themselves in terms of supporting SMMEs? Black, women, youth, rural, township areas to ensure that their operations are inclusive. How are banks mentoring and supporting SMMEs? Um, BASA reports that, that banks want to lend um, and uh, borrowers need to meet certain criteria. But we also have a very unequal, unequal society and we have the legacies of the past. The banks are part of the economic exploitation of the majority of black people. We know of what's with the redlining or blacklisting where in some areas people weren't given bonds, people weren't given access to finance. Um, how we, what, what role is the bank going to do to address the legacies, economic legacies of the part? Look, the government can do certain, but as the banks, I mean, you guys made so much profit uh, in the last period. And it's not as if you are, the banks are stable. It's all of those things. The government is, meet, is saying, here is a scheme, the national treasury, and we're just not getting a sense that the banks are coming uh, to the party on, on some of these uh, on these uh, issues. Um, I'm going to go through the list of the questions. Um, the IM, IFC reports on SMME funding gap uh, is 300 billion in our country. BASA acknowledges that is a critical gap that requires urgent attention. Um, what are the banks going to do very concretely with the development finance institutes, with government, to reduce the funding gap? Because funding for business, look, government can't produce all the jobs, uh, can't create jobs, and uh, we have a, 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 a limited budget. And so we need the private sector, we need this partnership. Um, uh, in the bounce back scheme, government is covering 25, 20.5% 20 of the risk while the bank is, is supposed to cover 79% of the risk. I mean, um, it is a, it sounds like a lucrative. Does banks want government to cover all the risk? Are they prepared to meet the bank's uh, government halfway? Uh, is, is this a practical uh, resolution to have banks or get government underwrite these risks? And if government is underwriting these risks by 20%, why, why are you also not coming to the party with uh, giving more opportunities to our people? Um, yeah, so those are some of the questions that, that came through uh, Kulakani. Um, I know there's still more debates and more inputs that is needed, but let's, uh, I'm just going to go last round of members. Um, and I think for me, the one thing is, what concessions are these banks prepared to make for with the informal traders or the informal, uh, I mean, you, you really put it really nicely, the, the um, survivalist uh, economy, those people that just make trade just for the for food on the table, you 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 put them down as three million people, and then the small business is is uh, or informal traders of two million, and the one that are formalized is only eight hundred thousand. So clearly, the bottom rank, those survivalist three million people that is going to sell their fed cook on on the station or gogos selling chips at the at the tuck shop, those are survivalists. They, they are doing something. They are eking out an existence. Clearly, we must have creative, uh, developmental, uh, innovative solutions. Can't we use the technology and the brains of our people in, uh, in the banking sector? You, 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 you one of the best uh, banking sectors, not only in our country, but in the world. Can't we use that intellectual property to, to, to say, let's do something for our communities at the, at the bottom end? Um, I see... Uh, uh, Honorable Goma also wanting to have a last bite, and then uh, we'll hand over to you, Kolopani. Honorable Goma. Thank uh, you very much. Yes. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair, for another opportunity. Uh, this is the last one. Um, Chair, I just want to also find out from the banks, do they have time or sessions where they organize the small businesses, because they are also stakeholders of the banks. 
and to say, we want to develop them so that tomorrow when they come to our institutions to ask for money, then they know what is it that they need to bring. You know, the banks need to also tell us if they are doing that, those information workshops for the people, especially small businesses, to develop them and train them and let them know how to do their business plans as well as uh, what they're looking at when they come to them. Not when they only apply is when then they say that this is what you don't have. And at the time, a person is desperate and have, doesn't have actually all the needs that the bank want from them. So that is also one thing. Do they actually put, um, contribute towards the development of the small businesses in ensuring that they also can comply with their, with their uh, requirements? Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Honorable Gumba. Okay, April, Honorable April, last, uh, last input. Please proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Yes, I think I, I'm partly covered by Honorable Gumba just in saying that financial literacy is one of the things that we know that we lack a lot in our country and it would be fantastic if the banks could just give us clarity in terms of the finan financial literacy that they are offering to small businesses, but not only to small businesses, even uh, at the level of our schools, our, uh, their clients, anyone who brings money to the bank, the financial literacy is, is lacking a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much for all the questions. Uh, Comrade Kulakani, before we hand over to you. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Could I just ask, uh, how much time do I have? This will determine how many of the questions I try to tackle uh, with my team, obviously, uh, in this setting. So just give me an indication, Chair. Uh, we, you get, you had a, a hour for presentation. Now we're giving you about 10, 15 minutes for, for wrap up. Okay, okay. So thanks for that. Let me start by saying that, is this something I uh, should- Sorry, Chair. Order, order, Chair. Okay. Uh, April, what's your order? I would also like, my, I would like to request the questions that we have put on the chat. If the bank could answer those ones on writing and send it to us, then it gives us time to get some answers. And then I know in 15 minutes, Kuleka and you would not be able to answer everything, but some of that questions in writing would help us. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Honorable April. That's a good intervention. So Kulekani, maybe just overview. I think you got the gist of the questions, but we want to engage with the banks more. So those questions that you can't answer now, maybe a written submission. And also, I think the one thing we want to do is just to get some form of commitment to increase lending to the township and informal sector uh, business and also then report to us on a regular basis. So look, I think for us, it's not about the polemic and the discussion and the debate, but rather very practically, you'll be making a plea we, we want the banks to do more for our people. And we just want you to say, yes, you are prepared to go back to the banks and say, yes, we don't want our adversarial relationship. We really want you to hold our hands and say, look guys, make your profits, do those things, but also help the bottom of, of South Africans come up. And so that's, that's essentially Kulukani, uh, the commitment we want from you. But over to you. No, thank you very much. And uh, I must say that the intervention by Honorable April has been my escape clause. So I, I get to escape the grilling, uh, uh, Honorable Jacobs. I, I should have said this at the beginning, that um, when you said it's good to see you again, it is good to see you again because the questions and the debates uh, here remind me of the many years and the many debates we used to have about development issues. So, so it's good to see that you haven't lost your, your fighting spirit on behalf of our people. Um, in, in, because of time, obviously won't be able to get through all of the questions. Um, the, we can make a commitment here to, to harvest the questions from the, the chat line uh, obviously with the assist assistance of uh, the committee secretariat. I saw you reading out your question from a prepared text, Honorable Chair. I would implore you to share that with us so that we can get the questions precisely uh, and, and be able to, to respond to you. And just to also say, uh, Honorable Chair, that uh, how we, um, structured our presentation that we just uh, gave to you was guided by 
the, the, the wording in the invitation that we got, which was a sort of capacity building a type of engagement. So we've structured this um, presentation so that it gives and sets out some of the foundational issues about banking and lending, how it works, so that we can build on that understanding, uh, build on that to see how then do we understand what is being done, what can be done uh, uh, differently. So I just want to be clear that we, 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 we wanted to make sure that when we start to tackle these issues, we do not come here to the committee and bore you with banking jargon, but that we build a, a firm understanding, shared understanding of, of, of the issues. So, so that, that, that I thought is important. Many, in fact, all the questions raised are absolutely critical. I would suggest that uh, while we go back to, to respond in writing to the questions put to us, we also, in the interest and in the spirit of, of capacity building and joint learning, also study the presentation that was presented here because many of the questions, the answers lie in the presentation itself. Not all, definitely not all. There's a lot that can be uh, beefed up to, to address uh, members' questions. Let me deal with some of the questions in closing, just um, having set out that. Uh, so, so I start with the question around um, the profits. You fell short of saying super profits by banks. Um, and, and in the presentation, we did talk a little bit about how the whole profit thing works, right? Who's, who do the profits go to? You yourself have read out some of the, of the, of the text where that, that is outlined. And, and that is absolutely critical to, to understand. And so these massive profits, to use your, your, your terminology, belong to South Africans uh, in different forms and shapes. Some of those profits will obviously uh, go back to, 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 to the depositors, as, as we've said, in the form of the little bit of interest that they get given on their savings. A big part of it goes to, to, to pensioners uh, who are shareholders of banks and various other shareholders. So, so one is to kind of appreciate that. The question that, that uh, do we give anything for free? I would like to answer that in two parts. The first part is that, um, on the one hand, obviously, like every other corporate in South Africa, banks have a, a CSI program where they set aside a certain percentage of the profits, which go to a different range of, of, of initiatives, developmental initiatives. And if you look at our transformation report, there are figures there of how much ba banks spend on their CSI commitments. So that, that's one part. There definitely is something that banks do give back to society through the CSI programs. Two, we have a, a, a consumer financial education program that we've been running for many, many years, uh, jointly with the Department of Education in schools, was interrupted by COVID obviously, but we continue to work with schools to deliver financial education for schools. We also, various banks individually, but also at a BASA level have programs where we, we try to educate uh, small businesses about the financial matters so that they are better prepared. In fact, individual banks have programs where they try to work with some of the customers who on application may not be quite ready for credit, but they need to be assisted with one or two things in order to be able to, to become uh, uh, good for credit, as we say in the banking industry. So again, the various initiatives, if there's one thing that keeps banks uh, awake at night is how can we improve business, business that's coming in, obviously people who are looking for more loans, how can we write out more loans basically? On the other hand, how can we make sure that those loans that are written out um, continue to perform? So this is one of the things that keeps banks um, uh, awake at night because it is their bread and butter. And there's a whole range of initiatives that are trying to do that. Um, 
And and honorable chair, in closing, I would just maybe like to 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 talk to one more question, and then I'll ask uh, Paul, one of my colleagues, to 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 take one question, and then we will we will end there so that we do not keep you here uh, for a very long time. Uh, chair, there, there was a question about the, the the bounce back scheme and how it has worked relative to the loan guarantee scheme. So Paul will pick up on the loan guarantee scheme. All of those questions that relate to uh, performance of these different loan products, right? One underlying factor, and of course the precise details may differ for one uh, applicant to another, but one underlying factor you, you will find is that, uh, is there a huge demand for this bounce back scheme? Um, the answer is probably not. If we simply judge it by what we've seen happening previously, and we do not as a, as a banking association have all of the details about the performance of the scheme, which is a national credit, uh, a treasury scheme, we are prepared to, to try and extract some of the data there and, and be able to answer your question. But the question of demand, we can do all manner of innovations on the supply side of credit, uh, but if there's no demand, you're not going to see any difference. And so I think we need to appreciate that, uh, but we will give you a comprehensive answer to the question. Uh, but what we do need to analyze is that uh, our economy is practically on its knees, right? And, and in an economy that is, is, is on its knees, the, the, there is unlikely to be demand for credit for reasons that we've stated earlier. So we do need collectively the legislatures, uh, the policymakers in Pretoria, the private sector need to prioritize the question of how do we get this economy growing again? What measures are necessary? What reforms are necessary to get this economy growing again? That has to be the fundamental question that, uh, that we all commit to. And it's not just any growth, it needs to be inclusive growth because we know that uh, if we just chase growth, the likelihood is that our people in townships and other places, rural areas are going to be left behind. So how do we commit to measures of inclusive economic growth is a, the type of debate that should be had in all places in the legislatures throughout the country, in, in, in the boardrooms of, of private sector companies and in the boardrooms of the policymakers in Pretoria. Let me invite my colleague, uh, Paul, to make some remarks and uh, Chair, we will then go through all of the questions and give you okay. comprehensive responses. Paul. Um, thank you, Kulakani. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, good to see you again too. Um, perhaps just to comment on the loan guarantee scheme and the, um, the bounce back scheme, what needs to be recognized is that a lot of the criteria for those schemes were in fact set in place by National Treasury and the South African Reserve Bank. Um, and it, to um, Honorable April's question is, in fact, bank, banks were asked and were very clearly to ensure that they did not expose National Treasury to any additional risk. And that was one of the reasons why, as far as possible, banks met many or applied many of the normal risk criteria to, uh, to the LGS loans. Secondly, I think our approach to the outcomes of the LGS would be slightly different. We don't, would not necessarily view the outcomes as dismal. While many people look at the 200 billion um, as opposed to the as the big number, as opposed to the 18 billion that was in fact linked out, the LGS was part of an overall scheme to ensure that to those who wanted credit, especially during COVID, uh, during the COVID period, credit and who could afford to um, take up credit, that credit was available to them. And I think it, to look at the 200 billion in isolation is incorrect. We would need to look at the 18 billion that came out under the LGS scheme. We would need to look at the six, 600 billion, um, 617 billion 
that went out in terms of loan restructuring um, on the part of, of banks at the same uh, at the same time. So the we would characterize or be much more yeah would characterize the LGS as being much more successful than it often gets credit for. And again, just to make the point that during that period, anybody who needed access to credit and qualified for access to credit did get credit. Um, and the impact, the economic impact of COVID-19 would have been much worse if access to credit was, was not maintained. Um, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. And um, thanks again for your presentations. Uh, comrades, I think what we will continue this dialogue, we, we appreciate the Banking Association of South Africa, but we are asking you to go back and do more for our communities. We, we, we are in a, and you, you make the point about inclusive and shared growth, uh, and our, uh, our economy is overheating in today's the mini budgets uh, speech. But I think if we, we honest with ourselves, we need to find mechanisms and we need clever people in the room to help our people uh, access finance. You know, um, even though with the Credit Regulation uh, Act, there's still many poor people are only getting the Amazonis and the loan sharks access to finance. And the fact that the people are not taking up the loan uh, facility that government is providing says that the loans are not really affordable and that you still apply to bigger risk profile. So we, we're asking you to go back and help with um, creating financial products that is accessible, that is affordable, and also sustainable. We, we're not saying banks mustn't make profit. We're asking banks, because you see in the market, we, we work with microfinance, development finance institutions. Government can't do this alone. We only have two, two billion rand from government that's allocated to this department. It's a drop in the ocean. I mean, you've also quoted now, we actually need, with all the business plans, with all the resources, we need 300 billion rand for small microfinance enterprises. So we're asking our colleagues, comrades in the financial sector to understand the plight of our communities, plight of our people, especially in the townships. You know, township people, uh, black people, African people, colored people, um, poor communities want to work, want to use their labor and their intellect. And we're asking our South Africans to be a, a entrepreneurial society. We, we, we can't afford the, the welfare society that we are doing now. So we're asking people to use their resources to make means, but we're also asking the financial sector to help us with government. And I think what our president is trying to do it, with the COVID and also with the bounce back scheme is to say, here is a little bit of money. Let's see how we can help our communities. And so we're asking our clever communities in the banks to meet us halfway. Um, we want you to come back, uh, Kulakani, um, where you, 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 you come up. I saw a nice ad by one of the, one of the banks and I don't want to uh, say who it was, but I, I was very impressed with the innovative ways of accessing um, it was the Gogo -Go ad that was uh, saying, look, we're making uh, finance more available for our people. We want more of those. You see, we need to tell the good news story. We, 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 we want our banking association uh, to embrace the township economy, embrace uh, the informal economy, embrace those people that is unbankable. Um, because it, even though it's not profitable, those are also people that is deserving when the president says we want no one to be left behind, it must also be in the economic space. So um, colleagues, we, we're gonna call on you. We want to wish you well. We want to say, uh, continue the good work um, and also continue to, to push that we can get these products to our townships, do more, encourage our, our banks to do more in the townships. You see, we don't just want black people to be consumers because that's also a paradigm shift. You, you give black people uh, loans for cars and for clothes and material and retail and all of those things. So we are consumers only. And so it's really nice to be a consumer because there's big profits in making for consumers. But 
it takes a particular South African to say, okay, let's not buy the big Mercedes car, but let's rather use that loan to start a business, a township business. And, and that's what we want our banks also to, to, to come to the party. We thank you. Um, members, we're going to move over to the, um, to the uh, cooperative. You, you, you're welcome to stay, Pasa, but uh, thank you again to all the members. And uh, without wasting time, I'm going to hand over to the National Treasuries, the Corporate uh, Development Bank Agency. Uh, Honorable Kum, um, Mr. Kunene, can we give them uh, the slot? Thank you again, uh, Comrade from Basel. Thank you, Honorable Kum. I'm not talking anymore. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> okay, Paul, uh, is it you that's going to present uh, on behalf of the Cooperative Bank? Uh, yes, that's that's correct, Honorable Chair. Uh, okay. While Please proceed. I I, uh, I think uh, my colleagues are here as well. Uh, uh, Ms. Sauli uh, will probably get the presentation on the screen. I hope that they should be assisted there. And it seems that uh, Mr. Matsimba and Mampani hasn't arrived yet. So I'll go through the presentation. But while we are waiting for the presentation to, to be uh, reflected on the screen, maybe just take you back um, what happened during the past 12 years since this uh, cooperative banks development agency was established. So you can all recall that the, the act was a fast track through parliament to establish uh, the agency to develop the cooperative banks. And uh, maybe just I would just introduce myself to say, uh, uh, I've only uh, started at the agency in May, but I've been with the reserve bank before and I've been involved in the development of the of the legislation and the regulation and supervisions and, and so forth. So initially, um, the Cooperative Banks Development Agency uh, supervised small cooperative banks. The Reserve Bank supervised the larger cooperative banks and the CBDA uh, was responsible for the development side of it. So later on, uh, and oh, so all the other cooperatives that were not uh, registered as banks uh, operating um, Mr. Rousseau, let me let me just check if they are giving you sharing rights. Then you can flag your presentation. Um, it will, yeah, if you can give uh, Ms. Saoli the sharing rights. Yeah, Mr. Um, okay. uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Kunene, if you can give Ms. Haoli the the sharing rights, please, so we can see the presentation. Nomadelu Saoli. But please proceed while we are waiting yeah, for them. To yeah, this is not on the presentation. As such. So uh, later on, um, it was uh, decided that the Reserve Bank should take the smaller cooperative banks as well. And then the self-regulatory body, I think it was SAC or failed. And the Cooperative Banks Development Agency took responsibility to uh, supervise and regulate uh, the smaller cooperative, cooperative banks, which were not registered, registered in terms of the Banks Act. And when the development of the Prudential Authority came along, all these banks, I mean, the small cooperative banks, the large cooperative banks, and those that operated in terms of the exemption notice were transferred for supervision and regulation by the Prudential Authority. And what remained behind is the development <coughs> side of cooperative banks. Uh, so the question is, is supervision and regulation at the correct place? Yes, it belongs at the South African Reserve Bank, at the Prudential Authority. Development, we are sitting here now with only 15 staff members left, only responsible uh, for, for, for development, it's, and which are five of them or six of them are in, in, in corporate. So there are only 10 people actually providing assistance and development and training to the cooperative uh, uh, institutions out there. And uh, that is in a nutshell. So with the merger coming on, I believe that uh, the development must be situated in, in small business development. 15 people now, we're merging into an entity will, which will probably have 900 people. Uh, CIFA will be there, CIDA will be there, and this uh, uh, CBDA will be there. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a great day, I think, when that merger can take place, where there will be probably pro uh, pro proper supervision a proper uh, uh, training assistance 
and so on that can be given to the uh, cooperative banking sector. So to get to the uh, um, presentation, I think we had a few uh, pointers from, from uh, your side. And the first one was to, with regard to the a, in Daba that's taking place. Uh, if we can have that slide, please, uh, on the Indaba. So the first, we are taking you through the, uh, uh, yeah. So uh, with regard to the Indaba that's taking place, the Corporate Banks Development Agency will be hosting the this year's uh, Indaba in the Eastern Cape. And it's an annual event where all the CBI's cooperative banking institutions get together and we learn from each other. And with the, this year, it, it, it'll be a special uh, focus on uh, towards the implementation of the cooperative banking uh, 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 strategy. And, and this strategy as outlined here, here is, is basically uh, uh, around the establishment of the uh, secondary cooperative bank, access to financial infrastructure, support organizations, and uh, tiering as well as the tiered uh, licensing for proportional supervision. Uh, I think the other main focus, of course, will be uh, on the training, uh, pertinent topics that will be provided for by the World Bank. And they will be, I think, two days set aside uh, for training the CBIs in that manner. And the office, our office will, of course, sent through the invitations uh, to the portfolio committee members in, in due course. Uh, now, the strategy on a very high level, level is uh, the cooperative banking sector is one of the key players in financial inclusion and some, uh, promote the savings uh, culture. Uh, as I always say, where there's a bank, there's growth. Now, with all these banks, that the cooperative banks that have been established, you must remember none of them received any grants or donations or uh, uh, money from government, nothing. So they take members deposit, they give it out to the community to do whatever uh, uh, the members need the money for. On the interest they own, they make profits and they grow their bank. Uh, however, there is a low penetration in the sector compared to other countries um, and slow growth and also uh, adoption of technical innovations. Many of these uh, smaller cooperative banks still do the uh, banking business manually. And um, in general, it's not as attractive uh, to the consumers as the, as the major banks would be. However, despite this lack of te uh, technical innovation, the cooperative banking sector holds uh, about a, have a loan book of 368 million and they have 548 million in assets. And there are 29 C, uh, cooperative banking institutions. Remember in the, when we start up, uh, 12 years ago, there were only two cooperative banks registered. I think there are around uh, six now and uh, 23 of the smaller cooperative financial institutions. And they have managed to grow, to grow what, we, what we say organically. In other words, only by by receiving, uh, improving the, the loan book and uh, improving their, their deposits. So according to the World Bank, uh, financial inclusion means that individuals and businesses have access to usable and affordable financial products and services. In South African context, this would also include the population that is historically been excluded or underserved by the formal banking sector. Uh, so there is a gap that exists in access to financial services by individual uh, and, and small, small and medium enterprises. Uh, the, uh, according to the National Development Plan, I think the vision for 2030 is that we will achieve financial inclusion uh, of 90% of the population. But CBIs are key in providing access and they are the center of the value chain, more so the uh, kind of a self-help community. 
I think in South Africa, you can see that uh, it is, they, they, there must be a need, but I can foresee that in the, in the merged entity that one should promote the establishment of these cooperative banks by uh, not only uh, training the people, but giving them uh, resources and, 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 and make it possible for these cooperative uh, banks to be developed in the rural areas so uh, that the deposits of the community are used uh, to be given out as loans. And where there are banks, there are growth, and uh, uh, um, that will help also help with the unemployment in South Africa. So um, National Treasury, the World Bank, in, and, and CBDA is at the uh, moment uh, assisting the cooperative banking sector to adopt the, this uh, new strategy. And we are in the process of conducting uh, interviews and surveys uh, to develop this uh, strategic program of ours. Uh, in that uh, picture on the slide, you can see uh, the outline of this, um, the economic and financial inclusion for workers and mixed income communities through quality cooperative banking, uh, which is key of the pillars of the IT systems which are at the moment not up to standard for most of them, robust sources of funds and uh, digital delivery channels, which we hope to, to get uh, improved on uh, in the merged entity. So the enablers would be this, the secondary cooperative bank, which are in the process of being established through the assistance of the World Bank, access to uh, financial infrastructure, support organizations and tiered banking. With regard to the support organizations, we've only uh, registered one this year, and uh, the representative body, I think, was NACFISA. They basically uh, were, were, was deregistered. So in the blended finance space, uh, regarding uh, the question whether uh, why can't cooperative banks uh, participate in CIFA blended finance, I think the whole issue around there is the there are prudential standards and regulatory burdens that they must overcome. Uh, there are limits placed on, uh, on, 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 on what they can borrow and what they can uh, borrow use from external borrowing. Uh, the services of intermediaries are not uh, defined in the act nor in the regulations. In the process of amending the act, we are uh, trying to, 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 to enable that service to be be provided. Uh, one should be very careful just to use CFIs at the moment as intermediaries to uh, route your, your lending through to the SMMEs. I think it's a bit premature for that, but uh, I, I believe that probably in two years time that if the need arise that, uh, and there's proper uh, governance processes in place that this will definitely be, be an option. And just quickly to go to the, uh, the, 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 the hurdles of the, uh, of the act and the regulations, there is, oh, I, uh, I can explain this, uh, some regulations that's in the act and then the prudential authority with the enactment of the Financial Sector Regulation Act, uh, the PIR are now en uh, enabled to issue prudential standards well, all these are in, in fact regulations and they are limited uh, to 15% of the total assets to receive a, a, a maximum of 15% of the total assets in the way of external borrowing, which I believe was, uh, it's not a bad idea to ensure that you, that you increase your deposits, the savings culture, and that is organic in nature. So if you only give loans and route it through uh, and there are not proper governance uh, systems or incentive systems in place uh, that, that could easily fail and uh, you know, losses can be inc uh, incurred that way. Uh, with regard to the apex body, it's oh, on, that, on that score, we are definitely with the amendments of the acts. Uh, we are in work stream three on the, on, 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 on the working groups. Uh, and work stream one, we are attending to these issues. I know the, the proposed amendments to the National Small Enterprise Act and the Cooperative Banks Act will be soon out for, for, for comments uh, internally. And uh, in there, we will push for cooperative also 
to be able to provide intermediary services. With regard to the cap on the external borrowings, uh, we wanted that because I, I think it would have been the, the quickest way to push it through the act rather than uh, waiting for prudential standards to be issued, which is the same parliamentary process as, as amending the act. Uh, but we have we had to concur that it is it is the way where we uh, the limits on external borrowing should be lifted and that is by mean of amending or issuing new prudential standards uh, but we have quarterly meetings with the uh, prudential authority and we are also in the process of uh, concluding a memorandum of understanding with the prudential authority where we debate these issues and uh, we, we, we uh, see each other eye to eye and, uh, and, and discuss these issues in the interest of, of the cooperative banks in, in, in general. So uh, the status of the act is, uh, it's in the process of being amended. And after the amending, in, uh, the essence would be that the prudential authority would become sole custodian of the regulation and supervision of cooperative banks. And the Cooperative Banking Development Agency will, uh, it's all its uh, uh, powers and mandate will in essence be transferred in, into uh, the National Small Enterprise Act uh, when merged with, with uh, CIFA and CEDA. And uh, that is in a nutshell, the presentation in, 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 in an effort to save some time. Uh, I, I think we can rather concentrate on, on some questions and I would ask uh, Ms. Saoli Nomadelo to assist and if uh, Mr. Matsimbi Mambani is here also to assist in answering some of your questions. Thank you, Honorable Chair and, and members. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Rousseau. Um, thank you for the very informative presentation and uh, we, we, we're happy that you're there and we look forward to your turning the ship around there. Um, members, here we have it. It's uh, uh, mainly for information. Um, I think Cooperative Development Bank uh, um, shared their presentation. Uh, any questions of clarity, uh, any uh, inputs? Um, you know, cooperatives are, are important uh, during apartheid. Uh, there is um, the Afrikaner uh, communities were really developed by a strong sense of uh, cooperatives. Um, there was a cooperative for steel, for this, for that, for, for citrus, for potatoes, for all of those things. And, and the need for us to conceptualize the importance of cooperatives uh, cannot be overemphasized. I think we've made a lot of mistakes. There's a lot of lessons that we can learn from um, what we did wrong for, for cooperatives. Um, but I think for us, um, this is a great work. Um, I think for me also personally, the, we, we want to understand uh, the ownership. So uh, um, you said there was uh, 300 million rand that you have in your, in your, in your bank. Um, are we getting, um, uh, are we inviting your big corporate banks to also invest in it? Um, how do we set up the question of literacy, the question of advocacy on cooperatives? Um, how do we ensure that uh, we uh, get more people to come together and do the almost like a stock felt? Because stock felt is another way of, of uh, it's a fancy word for, for cooperatives. So, um, members, uh, let me check if there's any uh, uh, questions to uh, Mr. Rousseau on the cooperative uh, banks and uh, any questions and inputs and comments. Um, I invite members to uh, put up your hands. Honorable Lubengo, uh, you can go first. On cooperatives, any questions for, for them? Members, was it very clear? I see this is the one hand. Um, yes. Uh, yes, uh, 
Honorable Gomba? Yes, uh, Honorable Chair, thank you for the opportunity once more. I just, um, sorry, let me just open my camera. Um, yes, Honorable Chair, I just want to find out if they, um, if, if people are cooperatives, they come together with the common interest of doing the same business um, um, collectively. What, what I want to find out today also look at uh, the shareholders agreement because I don't understand this cooperative uh, issue coming to the legality of it in terms of the shareholders. Because Recording that, is, stopped. that is very, very important, uh, Honorable Chair, to, to see that. Recording in progress. The people that are forming part of the cooperative comply with the, 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 the laws because sometimes you find they are not aware that they are working as a collective that must actually have every time the mutual agreement and also the, 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 the cohesion within the, the people before you can, they can fund them. They, they, they must also give them the same development and training to say, this is how the cooperative works. And uh, before we can find you, we can find you, we need to see your, 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 your understanding of the organization itself, because it's not, an organization that is easy to run because there are different people, different families with a common understanding of going forward as a cooperative. So the shareholders agreements and all that, do they make sure that those people um, uh, are, are, are having those uh, documents in place? Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. Thank you, Honorable Ogumbo, very good question. Um, uh, Mr. So, I mean, the one thing I wanted to check, the the cooperative associations in South Africa, is there a relationship that you have with, with them as the bank? Um, what's your view of being part of BASA, the Banking Association of South Africa? We just heard the, them making presentation. And obviously um, your, your mandate is more of a developmental mandate. You want finance for cooperatives. Um, <clears throat> Uh, your own experience in the developmental space, I, I, I'm told you do come from the Reserve Bank. Um, so uh, aside from the technical uh, requirements, this, the strong thing is uh, the developmental uh, aspect of the cooperative bank. Um, do you have the capacity? Um, what are the ideas of expanding the bank? Um, to get more funding to your bank? And how do we ensure that do we understand the mistakes and lessons that we've learned from 20 odd years of cooperative uh, uh, finance? Uh, yes, there was a lot of challenges around cooperative finance. Um, uh, in the past, people used to, uh, government used to give, if I form a cooperative now, um, I just register something and then uh, I get my money from government and I run away and, uh, and I don't do anything about uh, cooperatives. Uh, uh, what are the lessons that you're going to do now differently? Um, uh, we believe that different forms of economic ownership is the way to go. We believe in a mixed economy so that communities can come together and buy a bucky, for example, and then collectively go to the market and use that bucky in a cooperative way. Uh, we believe that Sam, Sam Drach, Mach, 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 if I'm saying it in Afrikaans properly, uh, together, uh, we, we can achieve more. Um, so, and the, the model, the economic model of cooperatives have worked everywhere. I mean, the Spain, and it's really growing amazing. Um, uh, even out in our own backyard, just uh, uh, 50 years ago, cooperatives worked in this country, albeit only for the Afrikaner people. So those are some of the questions uh, I have just as a, a curiosity that we want the banks to be on a new trajectory. We want the banks to not only give people money, but um, the paradigm of making cooperatives sexy and successful and sustainable. Those are some of just my thoughts. Uh, let me check, um, is there any other uh, inputs? Otherwise we will, okay. Um, I got a question in the, 
in the chat. Chairperson to confirm neither the president, the minister, or deputy minister is present in the session. Uh, I, I'm not sure. Uh, we'll we'll ask uh, on the, um, Mr. Kuneni to come to that question. But uh, Mr. Lusso, um your just some of your inputs uh, on on the questions that was raised by Honourable Gumba and myself. Uh, yes, uh, uh, thank you, Honourable Chair. I think it's very important to understand the difference between uh, shareholders and members. So uh, the cooperatives are not uh, they are formed by members, and it doesn't matter how many uh, fees you put into the cooperative, you will still only have one vote. So it's one person, one vote. And um, they have annual meetings, and they kind of don't have shareholder agreements, but it's everything is uh, in the constitution, which the members must vote on how this cooperative uh, uh, will work. The other thing is that cooperative banks per se are the only cooperatives that needs to be registered in terms of the Cooperatives Act and the Cooperative Banks Act. It's like uh, the commercial banks that must register in terms of the Companies Act and uh, in terms of the Banks Act. So uh, never have these cooperative banks that are currently registered uh, with the Prudential Authority received any loans or grants or any money. So they have become sustainable by organic growth, by collecting deposits from members in the community, by lending those funds to members that they know can repay the money. Uh, and similar than banks, the main priority is, of course, to protect the members' deposits. So uh, if, if uh, they receive uh, a grant, that mistake has not been available to cooperative banks that uh, we can just give them two million and say listen try and and, and and develop your bank or give it out as loans because we initially think that that would be a, a danger and, and that money uh, will just probably hire us and it might go to waste as many of the other failing co cooperatives and uh, but we have learned the lesson is that some of these cooperatives, once they start up, they don't have enough uh, deposits. So how do they earn money without, uh, or they have 2 million, uh, 200,000 deposits or so a million in deposit, they can only start trading when they get the license. So in that, when they get the license, they can only start giving loans. So they don't have any income. So uh, what we try I I to encourage in the new legislation and to get uh, enabled in the new legislation is that uh, the new merged entity or the CBDA can provide financial and non-financial support and uh, that the limits, the hurdles that they look at uh, as percentages of total assets because a deposit is not, an asset, uh, is not an asset. It's only loans that are assets. So if you've got deposits, you've actually got uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, no assets per se, apart from what is shareholder capital, which must be held separately. So you can't, you, you're struggling to get money uh, to pay your initial salaries, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there will be a plan to, to develop kind of schemes that at startup, that uh, these uh, startup uh, cooperative banks can be provided some assistance by means of, of, of grants and, and donations and so on. And that uh, also uh, fixed capital are also uh, limited to 5%. So we also would like to get that hurdle away because in some instances, uh, entities would like to say, uh, give an house to a cooperative bank to start or a building. And, and that in terms of the current prudential requirements are not possible. So there are some legislative amendments that are required to make it more attractive for uh, cooperative banks to establish, to ensure that they get the necessary assistance, financially and non-financially support going forward. And with regard to the uh, training and development of, of, of cooperatives and the starting up of cooperative banks in all the rural communities, I think when we merged into this new entity using uh, CEDAS footprint, uh, that will of course obviously become available uh, to enhance that, that whole process. Thank you, Honorable Chair and members. 
Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Rousseau, and thanks for those responses. Um, members, I think we, uh, I saw uh, Honorable Hanif raising his hand. Uh, otherwise, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up. Uh, Honorable Hendricks, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chi. Honorable Chi, um, we've heard the responses with regard to the importance of cooperatives. Uh, that is the way that the Department of Social Welfare and other departments are, are now plowing in the resources to take families out of poverty. And there is a, um, a, a, a quite a number of uh, new cooperatives that has been launched uh, by CEDA and, and others in government. So the communities in the rural villages all over, they are, they are now compliant. They now a cooperative, and obviously funding is a problem, and government doesn't have the funding, so they need uh, low interest uh, funding, and this is an opportunity for the banks uh, to take uh, families uh, out of poverty. And uh, in the past, the banks used to triple the interest rates for poor people. They need to do. There need to be reparations. They need to make up for how they exploited poor people in the past. And they need to try and uh, give them uh, what I call interest-free loans. Many banks have got an Islamic uh, investment scheme where there's profit sharing and, uh, and there's no interest involved. And that is what the communities are looking for. At the moment, government has given a fishing vessel to Mapami village near Utata in London. They are going to put up a peanut butter manufacturing plant in Gradwell, which is out of the Thule is. Uh, but uh, that is just a, a, a gift for the community to get started. And I don't know how the banks are going to assist them uh, with their finance without preparing them. People that want to get out of poverty, families that want to get out of poverty, they don't want to you know, be burdened with high interest rates with the strict, uh, you know, uh, parameters of uh, government. You earlier on, the Honorable Chair, you know, you allowed debate on the millions that government made available for loans from the bank. And we know that the bank uh, only utilized about 10, 15% of the money. Now here, here the bank used these three criteria to disqualify many people. Uh, although government was prepared uh, to bankroll uh, and provide security for these loans. The banks ignore that. And for the loans that, that, that were secured, they didn't have the decency to reduce the interest rate because now they have a double whammy. They've got a very good client that can repay. Uh, they, uh, they have a government uh, from the sovereign monies that will, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, make up uh, in the unlikely event that these people will not be able to repay their, their loans. So the banks in South Africa has failed the nation. It has a very bad reputation. It hasn't transformed. It is the worst entity in the country uh, that is contributing to our economic development. I don't want to say we don't need any more banks and people must put their monies under their mattresses. Uh, and maybe the cooperative banks that you are pushing uh, so that South Africa is eventually rid of these banks. They are a, a obstacle. They like a chain around our necks. Uh, even those uh, companies coming out of the communities uh, that are doing well, they want to close them down. And uh, we must not be subject uh, to the uh, monopoly that banks has. And uh, so uh, I'm not very impressed with what I've heard today. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. Thank you, um, Honorable Hendricks. I think a lot of your inputs was uh, reserved for Barca, and I think they've left already. So um, I think it's well recorded. Uh, just concluding remarks, Mr. Rousseau, um, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, no, Honourable Chair and members, uh, no, no, no uh, concluding remarks other than, uh, you know, to, to, to commend the CBDA to date for the work that they've done in, in, in the very low failure rate of the cooperative banks uh, and the assistance in providing uh, the necessary trading 
training and and visits to these to these cooperative banks. Uh, Ms. Saoli, I don't know if you have any closing remarks from your side, and that will be all from my side. Thank you, uh, Chair. Ms. Howley? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Paul. Uh, just for the committee to, to note that for us as the Cooperative Banks Development Agency uh, that is mandated by uh, the Cooperative Banks Act number no. 40 of 2007, whose mandate is to develop cooperative banking so that it's a transformative tool. We would like the Portfolio Committee to understand that uh, for us to make it sexier, like you said earlier, that it's attractive uh, to the broader community. We need to support these cooperative banking institutions that we are supporting with a system. Otherwise, uh, cooperative banks currently, they don't appeal to you, for instance, Chairperson. They don't appeal to me for me to be able to bank with them because they are doing things manually. We want to do banking you know, at home, we want to do banking wherever we, we, we can and be able to access our funds wherever and whenever. But currently, the cooperative banking sector cannot compete with the commercial banks because we don't have that system. And I'm saying maybe this is something that government needs to take into consideration to say, how do we then as a transformative tool put a system for this corporate, assist them to acquire a, a system that will make them be on par with commercial banks in terms of offering first order banking services for the, the communities, the rural and the township businesses that want to uh, access and own the banks in the country. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good inputs, uh, Ms. Saule. Um, colleagues, the, the cooperative uh, development Bank and the agency is very important for us. Um, we note the progress to date, uh, Mr. Rousseau. Um, we want to invite you again uh, in maybe uh, uh, before the end of this uh, term, maybe in the next quarter or so, where we want to hear from you how we're going to get cooperative banking to another level. We will watch the space of your Indaba with keen interest. Uh, I hope it's not just going to be a talk shop. We hope that uh, you're going to come together with dealing with the innovation that is needed. Uh, you're going to look at partnerships with the private sector. You're going to look at uh, innovative products that you can bring to bear. And more importantly, maybe you should share with members uh, of this portfolio committee how to access funding. What's the procedures? How What training are you doing? Where are you getting involved? So we can also be part of your good good story. Um, we want you to succeed with cooperative uh, finance. Uh, we want you to grow. Um, hopefully, um, your two, your 300 million then that you have now, it will grow in such a way that you, you meet your developmental targets, meet your sustainability targets, and also ensure that we can showcase. And uh, that's the next thing we want you to do, Mr. So, so demonstrate where cooperatives is working demonstrate where you are prepared to invest. I think uh, Honorable Hendricks has uh, raised a few examples. Um, we, we know there's some cooperative uh, associations. We want to hear from them, how we're gonna work together. So it's not business as usual. We want you to move, uh, I see you have, you're sitting in the, in the offices there, Mr. Rousseau, uh, nice offices. We want the cooperatives to come to the people and we want you to, uh, to, to make it accessible. Yes, our challenge is to the private banks, the commercial banks, to make uh, it more accessible. We're also putting the same task to you. Um, let's look at these nice deals that we can fund and, 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 and be proud of as South Africans. Let's learn from the past uh, of where cooperatives is working. Let's ensure that uh, we, if there's a good idea uh, for co cooperatives, especially in our rural and our township areas, you know, the banks are not going in there um, and what, despite what they're saying, um, that's also a niche market for yourselves, um, where you can meet with the church people, meet with the religious, meet with the with the sports, meet with the uh, the faith based, all of these NGOs, NPOs, and say, look, in in coming together, we can we can buy something, and and in that way, it's not just about getting money, but also 
making this sustainable. So we're throwing up a lot of ideas, Mr. Rousseau and uh, Saulip, and we wish you good luck. And um, we will call you again. And please share if there's any good achievements or great uh, events or programs that you have. Uh, members, wherever they are, our members are across the country. So uh, I know um, Mr. Kruger there up in the north will be keen to come to, to one of your events and uh, uh, whoever will be keen to, to do that. So uh, um, thank you very much and uh, we will we'll leave it there. Thanks so much, everybody. Uh, Ms., uh, um, members, I, I, I want us, now that we finish with this presentation, um, we said that we're not going to do the minutes and we also want to release members because they still have to prepare for the mini budget. Uh, many of us are, are going to walk up to the city city hall. So, uh, Mr. Kunene, uh, any lasting input from your side before we close the meeting? No, no announcement? Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Chairperson. We don't have any announcement. Then okay. we'll, do, right. we'll do it, we'll, 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 we'll defer the minutes to the next meeting. All right, members uh, and participants and everybody and also the listeners and the viewers are at home. Thank you for, for, for being part of this uh, portfolio committee, the meeting standard here. Thanks so much, everybody.